Good morning, everyone. I'm Eileen Prose. I think it's fitting that on this day that we celebrate our Constitution, we have a very special man in our studios. In fact, one that definitely needs no introduction. He has been a public servant for 50 years, and you all certainly know Thomas P. Tip O'Neill. And he joins us this morning because he's uh, got a lot to say, and he's done it all in Man of the House, his new book. Eileen, I'm delighted to be with you. Tip, I'm delighted that you're Thank here. You. you have had a career, as I said, that spans nearly 50 years, 34 of them in Congress, 10 years as Speaker. And you're a man of candor and wit. You mince no words. And you do that in your book, which I think is the reason I enjoyed it. Well, I'm happy that you enjoyed it. Can we do some quotes and talk, you about, can them? talk about them? You don't mind. You want. All right, you have said in the book, I've known every president since Harry Truman, and there's no question in my mind that Ronald Reagan was the worst. It was sinful that Ronald Reagan ever became president. The, the thoughts behind that? Well, I, in a period of uh, six years working with the president, I don't know how many times I was invited to the White House. I only went to the White House, of course, on invitation. I wasn't an advisor to the president. I was the opposition. And uh, usually on Tuesday mornings, we would go over there and he would inform us what the, uh, the messages would be that would be coming to, uh, to the Congress and uh, what legislation he was interested in, things of that nature. Whenever we went over there, he always operated from a three by five card. He never got into a dialogue with the leadership himself. He would always turn the meeting over. If it was a foreign affairs matter with to Schultz, if it was a defense matter to Weinberger, transportation matter to Dole, to his cabinet people. Uh, he, wasn't, he wasn't very deep in the subjects uh, when you compared him with other presidents. And Nixon was a brilliant man, and so was Jimmy Carter and, and Jerry Ford. Uh, and so as I analyzed the president, the, uh, you don't become president of the United States by accident. You have to have ability and talent. But I have to say that he was a lazy fellow. He never did his homework, never paid attention to the briefings. He was never well prepared. And oftentimes, as I watched him give the State of the Union message and he would thrill the nation because he could handle the media better than any man that we have ever had on the history of this government, but he was merely talking words like an actor that had prepared a script. You write about the biggest blowout that you and Ronald Reagan had, and it was a very disturbing story. Well, it was um, one day we were talking about the unemployment figures, and uh, uh, they, went, they didn't seem to be moving. He, uh, there were about 12 pockets of depression, real unemployment, Youngstown, Ohio, and things of that nature, where the, uh, the unemployment rate was in double, double figures. And uh, Reagan said, well, there's jobs for everybody. Have you, did you see the Washington Post this weekend? There's 35 pages of jobs. Very sophisticated jobs. The average person that was looking for a job couldn't qualify. And they'd say, well, you know, he's an unemployment compensation. We're paying too much for the unemployment compensation. Person goes on unemployment compensation, and he calls up looking for a job. And then the second week, he calls up. And the third week, they have a job for him. Then you can't find him. He really doesn't want to go to work. Mm. I said, hey, Mr. President, you, you talk to me like that? I said, you mean the people in, in uh, Youngstown where the steel mills have all closed, 50% of the, the people on, uh, on unemployment compensation? You mean to tell me that their pride doesn't want them to go back and earn a living in the American style and the American family to support their people and, and uh, have better education and things like that? I said, my, your trouble, in my opinion, is you haven't grown in the five years you've been president of the United States. You're still selling the, st the same stuff, and I don't believe it, Mr. President. I think you're wrong. Well, uh, Senator Simpson from Wyoming, he said, this is awful. He said, you're the leader of the opposition and the president the leader of the free world. And he says, you have this bickering like this. He says, it's wrong. And he said, it always gets into the press. Well, I said, I have the highest respect for the president of the United States and, 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 the, and the title as the president, but I said, I'm the leader of the opposition, and I can't have him say these remarks. I said, people would think that I'm acquiescing to what he says. When you go out, they'll say, did Tip O'Neill respond? So I have to respond and tell you my opinion. Well, that was a real, well, he said to me, you know, uh, I said, I have the highest respect. He said, I don't think you have the respect for me. I said, Mr. President, that is true. I've got the greatest respect for you. You mentioned Jimmy Carter. You wouldn't have had that kind of a conflict with him. You called him one of the smartest presidents we've ever had. Well, Jimmy Carter was brilliant. There's no question about it. I never, I've never met a man as equally brilliant. He operated with no three by five cars. Uh, if you were talking about the defense of the nation, if you were talking about the SAT talks or the SALT talks, if you were talking about the guided missiles, if you were talking about opposition in the defense world, he knew more about it than his secretary of, of defense. He was just absolutely brilliant. 
you're talking about humanitarianism, you're talking about domestic affairs, you're talking about uh, the effects of, uh, of the Central America, or you're talking about the Panama Canal, any of those things that you're talking about, he was an absolute, complete expert with regards to the subject. Now, Jimmy Carter had problems. He had a bad staff, in my opinion, who came to Washington with a chip on their shoulder against the leadership of the Democratic Party and the institution as a whole. And uh, secondly, he had too many balls in the air. He sent, kept sending over too much legislation. Reagan, on the other hand, while I never, uh, uh, President Reagan, while I never agreed with his philosophy, he had a brilliant staff around him. He also had the Iran hostage affair. I mean, that, 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 uh, did that color his memory for all of us? Oh, the, well, there were two things went bad in the, in the Carter administration. One was the price of oil went from about $14 a barrel to $44 a barrel, and it set off a world depression and it caused an energy, co uh, an energy problem. The second, of course, was the Iranian situation and the hostages. Jimmy Carter, as time goes on, his record is going to show him very well uh, with regards to the, uh, the Camp David talks, with regards to the humanitarian uh, movement that he had, with regards to speaking up to Russia, with regards to Afghanistan. He was right in shutting them off from farm products and sophisticated equipment and keeping our, our people out of the Olympics. He was the first man that really spoke up to the Russians since Truman. And so Carter, as time goes along, I think Carter's going to be, look much better in the eyes of historians. You'll never forgive Nixon, will you, for desecrating the office of president? At least that's what you write. Well, that, that's sad. No man ever went to the presidency as well prepared as, as Nixon. He uh, was a lawyer, member of the House, member of the Senate, eight years of vice president, defeated by Jack Kennedy. And then he had eight years uh, <clears throat> preparing himself for the presidency. He knew much, so much about foreign affairs. He was excellent as far as China and Russia was concerned. Actually, the, uh, the poverty program that we put into effect with laws under the, uh, under the Johnson administration, uh, we wrote the laws, but he actually put them in effect. The, uh, the food stamp bill, uh, the Social Security, uh, uh, the, the certain increments in the Social Security. But he had a quirk about him. He had strange people around him. He, had a, he didn't have a trust or a faith and uh, in people. Uh, he was always uh, leery of his own cabinet members, and he had a watchdog in there uh, to watch his own uh, cabinet members and how they were operating. But uh, more than that, uh, the, the, the distrust uh, and the uncertainty, he lied to the American people. And it, it, was, it was deeply regrettable. Uh, his actions. Lyndon Johnson, during Vietnam, you didn't. You say you didn't have the courage to vote your conscience, and it took a Boston College young man to to sway you and make you think about that, didn't it? Well, that, <coughs> that's not. <coughs> By the way, uh, this is cold water. What would you like? You know, the interesting thing: every time, <laughs> every time the president would come to the Capitol, he always comes to the Speaker's office first. He's going to address the Congress. He always wanted a pot of hot water. And I used to say, I wonder what he wants that pot of hot water for. Finally, one day, I said, Mr. President, you always have a pot of hot water. Well, he said, I goggle and drink hot water. It loosens the, in your throat. He said, Frank Sinatra told me that, he said, 40, 40 years ago. So cold water has, you a know tendency, what? has a tendency to close. We'll take a break. We'll get you hot water, and we'll talk about Lyndon Johnson in okay. Vietnam when we come back. We'll be right back with Tip O'Neill. <laughs> after 9. It's 66 degrees outside, but it's hot in here. Speaker Tip O'Neill joins us. We were talking as we... As Eileen, we... you're drinking tea and you gave me cold water. <laughs> so you're a pro. You, you know, know that you're supposed to have Let me tell you, I lived with your book this summer, and I was in Truro reading it, and reading about how you were hung in effigy in Truro over the national seashore. And there's so much to cover that it's difficult to do it, I think, you know? Eddie Bowen and I are the original sponsors of the Cape Cod National Park. Thank goodness. And we look with pride. You should. And uh, there were only 26 miles of public beach in Massachusetts with a coastline of its inlets and everything of over 700 miles. That's 55 miles of beautiful stretch preserved for the people And of for our children and grandchildren right. and on and on. Lyndon Johnson, uh, I want to get back to that because Vietnam was such a traumatic time and, and, and it was interesting you were so candid saying you didn't have the courage well, to I vote your conscience. Well, I didn't have the courage. What, what happened when I said I didn't have the courage? After I had talked with Johnson and... Uh, 
You know, he when I in the book I explained that uh, I was out playing cards the night before and I came in about one or two mm -hmm. o'clock. Eddie Boland said the White House is is anxious. Secret Service men are downstairs. You to call the White House no matter what time you come in. What about what? You have changed in your position on Vietnam, but that's three months ago. Well, they're just finding out on the White House. The Washington Star has a front page story on it. It says. Uh, uh, first of close friends of, of President uh, changed his position. And uh, so I went to the White House the next morning and Johnson, what kind of an SOB are you? You've been a good friend of mine. Do this to me. Say, hey, Mr. President, listen, I want you to know that uh, I just think you're wrong. I said, I've, I've talked to the boys, I've talked to leadership, I've talked to assistant secretaries, I've talked to admirals, I've talked to generals. Uh, I said, the Marine General uh, uh, Shoke that just quit is writing a book. When you're over there and you, uh, you can't cross the 56th parallel and you can't shoot until you've shot at and you don't <laughs> mind the harbors and you don't knock out the, uh, the power plants and things like that, what kind of a war? I just think you're absolutely wrong and I can't, I can't agree with you. Well, he said, you know, he said, uh, that's interesting. He said, I thought you did it because of the students in Harvard Square, I said. Because of your constituents being all, a said, lot of students listen, up here. I get the back street voter, I said, yeah. you know, the Harvard people, and uh, they, uh, they look at me as a, an old-fashioned Paul, and I'm not their cup of tea. And you learned a long time ago to ask for a vote, didn't you? Yes, but let me tell you, so he said to me, <laughs> well, he said, you know, you're the first of the establishment, he said, that's changed. He said, I'd appreciate it, he said, if you didn't give any interviews. Now, that's where I made my mistake. I didn't give any interviews. Later on, uh, I realized that I was wrong, and I was one of the leaders, I believe, at that time, in helping to change the opinion of the American people and the opinion of Congress. Jack uh, Kennedy saw your loyalty early on during a campaign, and, and it was a wonderful story. I want people to buy the book and read that. But you couldn't believe it, you said, when you first saw him, this scrawny. He was a pasty-faced kid, scrawny. He had, I, I think he had malaria, to be perfectly honest. <laughs> oh, really? Truthful. He had just come back from the. He had just come back from the Philippine area, you know, and he was he wasn't well. And uh, but Mike Neville, he was the head, been the leader of the Congress. He was a member of the City Council in Cambridge. He was a very successful lawyer. Uh, it, he looked as though he was a cinch in the fight. Once Curley uh, announced that he wasn't going to run, everybody just was a foregone conclusion. Mike Neville was going to be the candidate, and then out of the cloud uh, uh, came this young fellow. Uh, and uh, we all know, of course, that uh, he changed the style of American politics. Mm -hmm. He changed the style of campaigning with his tease for women and uh, the, uh, the... His mailings and his, the his, money. He had six mailings. And, of course, he had the, the book uh, 109 mm -hmm. written by John Hershey, which was uh, the heroic, heroic, heroic life of him uh, over there in the Solomons. And uh, that was sent to everybody. By the time the election was over, uh, Mike had faded, but I couldn't believe it. Kennedy came to me, I don't know how many times. I was a member of the legislature. I guess I probably was Democratic leader at that time. I'd like to have you with me. No way. I'm with Mike Neville. He's my pal. He's my friend. He's my neighbor. And we've been friends for years. Uh, finally, uh, I said, look, at you're embarrassing me. You're embarrassing yourself. You know, don't come to me anymore. I'll tell you one thing. We're going to carry my area of the city. And uh, we did. Mike carried uh, Cambridge. Uh, but he lost but, to but, Kennedy. But he, he lost to Kennedy. And the following day, Kennedy called me and he said, Look at Tip. He said, I want to be friends. He said, You're the most loyal guy I ever saw. He said, Even though you knew that I was going to win because the polls all showed that you were loyal to the end, my next election, I want you around. Mm -hmm. And we became friends from then on. But you didn't like his brother Bobby, and Bobby didn't like you either. Well, you, you know, that was personal and political. When I started to write this book, I was, I did, I was determined that I wouldn't talk anything about a family life, personal life, social life of anybody. I was going to talk about the political lives, how I made the assessment through my eyes, with the friendship with them, the little stories along the line. I wanted to write a book that people would read. As far as Bobby Kennedy was concerned, uh, I always said he looked at me as a street corner politician, an old time buff, and he was the new style. And uh, I looked at him as a spoiled kid who didn't know, uh, you know, was unwashed behind the ears as far as politics was concerned. His brother uh, Jack said to me, and I'm quoting the book, my brother Bobby is the smartest politician I've ever met in my life. And uh, here he was, a near fight in politics. How can you determine like and mm -hmm. something like that? And he walked in and told us fellows uh, who were, uh, I was comparatively young then, or 25, 28 years, seven years younger than I am today. So 
Uh, I was still in my 40s. Who's this young fellow? You know, telling us fellows that have years of experience. We just didn't hit it off, that's all. We have some pictures of Where's you. What's the style? Uh, you you want to go back? You know this sure. baby photo you have in your book. Look uh -huh. at that. Isn't that great? <laughs> How old were you there? Five? Seven? Probably, probably four or five. Born and raised in North Cambridge, mostly Irish middle class neighborhood. I mean, how do you get into politics? And, and <laughs> look at well, the success. Well, my father was in politics before. As a matter of fact, I have an interesting, uh, an interesting family background. Uh, I had an uncle, Bill, who was elected to the city council in 1885 in the city of Cambridge in Ward 11. And uh, through a period of uh, my father having been a city councilor and various cousins being elected to the office, uh, myself serving for 50 years, I think of the last century, the O'Neills held public office in good old Dublin and North Cambridge for a period of almost 80 years. <laughs> Isn't that great? So we have, there was a respectability that went with the family. You write great stories about uh, a high school teacher named Sister Agatha. Loved her. She turned up every time you needed her, didn't she? Oh, she was beautiful. Absolutely. I graduated from St. John's High School, didn't want to go to college. I'm out there driving a truck, and it get to be about the 1st of December, and it was a little cold. I stopped to get a cup of coffee, and who goes walking by for a couple of nuns? Sister Agatha, what are you doing? I said, I'm driving the truck for Warren Brothers. You're driving a truck? I thought you had more ambition. I thought you were going to be a leader. I thought you were going to go to college. I want you to come down to the convent to see me. Faithfully and dutifully, I went down to the college. She said, I want you to go over to Boston College where they have the prep school over there, and I want you in college next year. Within a week, I was back in school and so she played a great part in the turning great of my lady. life. So she has friend. your she taught Millie, my wife, mm -hmm. she taught me, she taught Rosemary and she taught Tommy. Yeah. So she's part of our family. Millie, you say that she's the speaker of your house, and Absolutely. I think, well, she should be, Tip. Um, she held down the fort when you moved to Washington, you didn't take the kids, are you right, you regret that? Oh, well, Millie says I, I, I cherish her and spend uh, more lavish my love on my grandchildren than I ever did my, on my own children. And I, I make mention in the book about the fact that uh, when you're down in Washington, even though Eddie Bowen and I lived together and he was a great guy, uh, there's a touch of sadness in your life when you, when you uh, leave your family and you miss them. And I'd get down on Monday morning, come back on Friday morning. On the weekend, you were politically active, and I didn't have the time. And Millie was a mother and dad and the leader and the speaker of the house. There's no question about that. It's nice that. that you give her the credit that she's Oh, she's do. such a beautiful and strong person. Commercials. Big part of your life now, yeah, from shoe yeah, ads to beer yeah. ads, huh? <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, the first ad I did was uh, American Express, and uh, that was interesting. I got a telephone call when I do the American Express ad, and kind of, kind of gave my uh, ego an uplift to be perfectly truthful, because I had just sure. left office, and there's a period where you are a person making decisions that. Uh, Sometimes could be earth shaking, and you're sitting at home with your pajamas on and uh, your bathrobe reading the paper, and uh, they called you to do an American Express ad. I was delighted, and I was pleased to do it. And Ann Leibovitz was the uh, was the uh, took the pictures, and she did a terrific job, and I enjoyed it. The next thing I, you knew, I uh, I got called by uh, uh, Hush Puppies and. Uh, they encouraged me because Hagler was going to be in the air. Well, I love Hagler. Hagler's a great fighter, and he's a right. really good friend, and I thought he was a beautiful gentleman. So I got a kick out of it. There you <laughs> are with that. You know what else we have. Can we just show the, the little bit of our commercial? Let's show this. Now, ever hear a Flip O'Neill? Sounds familiar. Ooh. Well, Ed. <laughs> That ad took all day to do. I yeah, couldn't I know. believe it. I couldn't believe yeah. it. You know, there were, I think there were about uh, 60 extras in that, people walking behind, you know, they were all looking for a career in, in the films. Uh, but I want to beat Bob Yuka, and the original ad was going to be a beauty. I was going to have my three grandchildren. He was to be brushed from one seat to another, and I'm sitting up back in the Fenway Park with my three grandchildren, <laughs> and he comes up, and I know everybody in this town. But the, they don't sell that beer at Fenway, so they couldn't do <laughs> They couldn't do it. Yeah, uh, I guarantee you, uh, great reading. Man of the House, The Life and Political Memoirs of Speaker Tip O'Neill, also with William Novak, but it's absolutely so well written. Tip, thank you so much for being with uh, us this morning. It's a pleasure. Time flies too fast. It does. But you'll be at the Harvard Coop today yes. from 12 to 2, signing right. books, right? Well, I encourage everybody to get down there. Thank, thank you. you. Thank God you. bless you. Nice to have time to talk with you. Thank we'll you. be right back. What's hot and what's not in television this fall? Well, we have some people who really know their stuff.